Well, we're back after another frantic legs paddling under the water and me smiling with a fixed grin all over the place. I'll have a chat to everybody in due course once my stress levels have gone down. Um, in, in a minor change to our, to our program and back by popular demand, the excellent author of The Time Travelling Economist, available from all good booksellers and Palgrave Macmillan, um, and my good friend and hero of the hour, and economist at Renaissance Capital, I'd like to welcome for a, a 10 minute chat on life, travelling, time, Charlie Robertson. Thank you very much, Charlie. So I'm assured that the mic, yes, it works. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I tend to just hang around at conferences now and hope that someone says, you got 10 minutes to stand up and sell your book. I did offer. Um, and I offered because it's, it's horribly expensive. It's a 25 pound book from Macmillan. And I, I was saying this is primarily about Africa and South Asia. I want it to be selling for a fiver. And they said, do you understand how publishing makes money? And I said, no, not really. So 25 pounds it is. It's on discount at Amazon already, um, but not discounted enough yet. The book is basically trying to answer all the questions I've had for 10 years of coming to Africa conferences, 25 years doing emerging markets. And the same questions come up again and again. And we had them at that beginning panel. Um, so the first thing that's always interested me is why do some countries develop sooner or later over the last 300 years? Um, and the, the first answer was produced by a woman called Mary Jean Bowman in the 1960s. And she said it's to do with being able to read and write. Turns out that's rather important. Um, she said, if you haven't got 40% adult literacy, you never have sustainable growth. There are only a few countries in the world today that don't have 40% adult literacy. They include Afghanistan, until two or three years ago, Somalia, Guinea, Niger, Mali. There are a few number of countries in the, Mar in the, in the Sahel region. And, it, and you don't change literacy super quickly. So if you're sub 40% today, you're going to be lucky to be at 50 or 60% even in 10 or 20 years' time. So I gave this presentation to Africa Command in Germany in 2018, and they said, so you're saying we're going to continue to have civil strife, perhaps coups and war in this region for at least a decade to come? And I said, yes. And one of the more intelligent, uh, they were actually, they were all quite bright. These American officers were very impressive, and special forces guys mostly. And they said, if we'd spent not a trillion dollars bombing Afghanistan and 20 billion on education. If we'd started that 20 years ago, do you think we'd be in a different situation today in Afghanistan? I said, yes. So they pulled their troops out two years later. They didn't put a trillion dollars into education, but there you go. So education is absolutely essential. You need 40% to grow sustainably. You need 70 to 80% literacy to industrialize. So the first literate country, it turns out, was where my great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was from, which is Scotland. And they had universal adult literacy already in the 18th century. Um, Northern Europe came soon after. And when Japan stunned the world in 1905 by destroying the Russian fleet in a battle, it was because Japanese adult literacy was 75% when Russian was about 30 the illiterate Russians fought against the literate Japanese and got slaughtered. When, in 1896, the Italians invaded Abyssinia for the first time, they attacked with an illiterate army, and they lost. Forty years later, the Italians had advanced on the literacy scale and they managed to win, helped by copious amounts of mustard gas and some rather ruthless uh, tactics. So literacy is hugely, hugely important, and what's fantastic about the progress in Africa and indeed Asia for the last 60 years is that the colonial legacy, which is literacy rates of 
in West Africa, 3 to 5% adult literacy. Or 20% where Christian missionaries, often in the UK colonies, uh, was far too low in 1950 or 1960 for countries to even grow sustainably. They could grow when commodities were doing well, but they couldn't grow sustainably and they couldn't industrialize. We've now got to the point where most of the continent and South Asia and all of Asia, actually, apart from Pakistan and Afghanistan, are now at the 70 to 80 percent adult literacy rates that enable the continent to take off. So we hear about these brilliant, innovative thinkers. And there's over a billion people on the continent, vast majority now literate. Of course, there's going to be fantastic ideas. But once you've got that literate workforce who can industrialize, can do great things, what's the second thing they need to take off? Power. And that, again, was that CEU forum panel this morning. The essential need is power. Why did Scotland not industrialize before England? because England had the coal fields. Adam Smith writes about this in his book, The Wealth of Nations. 300 years ago, 250 years ago, the industry started in England because they had cheap available power. But how do we get cheap available power? Now this comes to the most controversial part of my book, which is fertility rates. And it's taken me 25 years to recognize these matter. So this is not as intuitive as the education part. I came across a paper about China, and it said that over half of the increase in Chinese savings in the last 40 years came about directly because of the fall in fertility. It went from six kids in 1970 to three kids by 1980. That's before the one-child policy had any effect, by the way. If you go across Asia today, the fertility rates are sub-three children in every country except for Afghanistan and Pakistan. If you've got six kids on average, as China had in 1970, at the end of the week, you've got no money to put into a bank. And if you've got under three kids, you do have money at the end of the week, on average, to put into a bank. So what I show in the book is you've got these bank deposits across many countries in sub-Sahara at about 20% of GDP. In China, it's about 200% of GDP. In Morocco, with a fertility rate of about two kids per woman, it's about 100% of GDP. The Moroccans have got so much money because they have a low fertility rate since the 1990s that their interest rates are just 2%. Same as China. Africa's just the same as Asia, in a low fertility country, whether it's Mauritius or whether it's Morocco. And with 2% interest rates, what can you do? You can roll out electricity very cheaply. You can roll out roads, ports, infrastructure. The government can borrow at 2% and invest more in health and education. Everything gets easy when the cap cost of capital is 2%. When the cost of capital is 20%, as it is in Ghana, and we heard this from the chairman of UBA just an hour ago, you can't do a 5, 10, 20 year investment in distribution, generation and transmission for electricity and produce the cheap power you need to industrialize. So what happens if you've got good education but high fertility? You're the Philippines in the 1990s. You don't have the cheap capital for jobs at home. You don't have the cheap capital for electricity at home. So what do your people do? Anybody who has been to Hong Kong in the 1990s or the 2000s will know exactly what happens. Filipinos leave en masse. They're educated, but they don't have the savings in the Philippines. So they leave. Not anymore. The fertility rate now in the Philippines has come down below three kids per woman, and the result is they've got plenty of electricity, which is one of the fastest growing economies in Asia today, the Philippines, because the fertility rates come down. The other one is India. They didn't have the literacy until about 2014 to industrialize, which is why your phones are made in China, not in India. But that will change, and India is now going to grow at 6 7% a year for the next 20, 30 years. So you've got this thing about the cost of capital, 
is linked to the fertility rate. There's also a second part of the story, which is in 1970 Asia. 50% of the population were children. When half the population are kids, they're not working. They're not working very profitably. In fact, they're my kids, they're not working at all. But if you've got 50% of adults, then some of them are looking after the kids. You're only talking, what, 30, 40% of the population could possibly work. Today in Asia, today in Asia, it's about 70% adults, 30% kids. You've now got a far higher proportion of the population can work. So what happens to per capita GDP growth with that demographic structure? Three, four, five percent a year. When it's 50% kids, it's one percent a year. 1970 Asia, the Hindu rate of growth was what people described India as. 50% kids, 1% per capita GDP growth. Yes, it gets slightly better, but you're not converging with America. So, and, and this problem of 1970 Asia was the disaster of the Cultural Revolution in China, the Hindu rate of growth in India, and civil war, well, war in Southeast Asia. Which continent today is 50% kids, 50% adults? It's Africa, and this is why there's a shortage of capital. This is why governments say, I borrow locally at 20%, or I borrow in dollars at seven or eight. Oh, I'm gonna borrow in dollars. And the debt level goes up, and then we run into debt problems. Pakistan, Bangladesh. Bangladesh got the fertility rate down to two. Pakistan is three and a half kids per woman. Which country? Did I ask in March, who's next after Sri Lanka? It's not Bangladesh. They've never issued a euro bond. They don't need to. They've got plenty of savings. Pakistan has borrowed a huge amount and is in danger of default in the next 12 months. So, where am I going with this? I'm going with the point of we've got a problem with fertility, not across the continent. Morocco's fine. Mauritius has got low fertility, low interest rates. They've got everything. They've got the cash. It's all good. There's going to be a whole host of really important countries that are going to get below three kids within 10 years. Egypt, 100 million people. Ethiopia, another 100 million people. Kenya, Ghana. These are countries which in 10 years' time are going to say, foreign money, no thanks. Don't need that anymore. We can do this for ourselves. We have our own savings. We have, through a lower fertility rate, bigger banking systems. We do not need foreign capital. Pakistan, by the way, should be there in 10 years' term, too. But there are other countries, or parts of countries, northern Nigeria. But southern Nigeria is in a much different place, but northern Nigeria, or Congo, or Angola, where the fertility rate is very high. So what can we do about this? The, and I will finish in, I've got two minutes, that's good. Um, it's going the wrong way. Am I over time? Okay, well, this is, what can you do about it? Interestingly, it comes back to the education point. Keep girls in school until they're 17, 18. If they're leaving at 12 or 13, and they have the first kid at 14, second kid at 17, third kid at 21, you're instantly putting yourself on a higher fertility route. That's not going to be an issue for Kenya or Tanzania or Uganda. Actually, those, those, those education numbers are already much improved. Um, second thing, infant mortality rates. It's incredibly powerful. Graph. If you die, if your kid dies before the age of five, you have another kid. Possibly two because of the risk of one dying. The number of kids dying in Nigeria under the age of five at the moment is 11%. Now, you may have worried about COVID at some point in the last two years because the fatality rate for COVID was about 1%-ish, maybe two, for unvaccinated people. You've got an 11% chance of dying just by being born Nigerian. So the result of that is the fertility rate in Nigeria is much, much higher. And it's not a wealth thing. This isn't about massive amounts of spending. They have the same per capita GDP in Ghana, Venezuela, but with vastly lower child mortality rates. So, I have yet to work out the charity that's going to get the tiny amount of royalties from the time-travelling economist. I'm just plugging it. 
but it's very likely to be something to do with infant mortality, child health, or women's education, because that, this is the key, along with governments telling people smaller families is probably a good thing, which is what Indonesia did in the 1980s and the 1990s. If the fertility rate comes down, savings will go up, the whole story of every conference that we're going to be attending on Africa, many countries in Africa for the next 10 years, will change. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that happening. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>